it's going to take more than just a policy framework. Because I, my, one of the things I keep emphasizing is this is not a one-shoe-fits-all. All. In Palau, we're able to do some things because of the situation we have there. But I tell you, in Hawaii, there's also a lot of good things that can happen outside of Honolulu or throughout the state of Hawaii. But it should be tailor-made to what the community wants. Because if the idea comes from the community, then I tell you the governor is more willing to listen to it. The state the legislature and the municipal councils, I think they would readily be supportive of it than if it came from the federal government or from the, uh, the state government. So it's all about community empowerment. It's all about community management plan that you and I are willing to go through outside the box method to make sure that there is a political way to do it. And I might add, this is not just a matter of conservation. You also have to have the sustainable financing for this. So what did Palau do? We now have probably one of the most expensive green fee that our tourists pay, $50, when every tourist comes to Palau. But surprisingly, when we did the survey, the tourists were very happy to pay the $50 because they saw that it did not go to the national treasury to support the operations, the normal operations of the government. It was going back to support the enforcement of the protected area network, the conservation areas. So people who come to Palau and appreciate the beauty of the environment realize that they can also be a partner. They can also play a part in sustaining and in protecting these wonders for the next generation. So that's, that's an important part of this consideration. There has to be some willingness of people to sacrifice, willingness of people to see that whatever, whatever plan it is, it's a community enforced uh, uh, policy that is not good just for us, but for generations to come. I will end my remarks now because I think if you have any more questions on this, you can ask. But I am here as a fellow islander to seek your support in thinking outside the box and doing something, not because we inherited this, but because we need to make sure that our future children also enjoy it. Thank you very much. <laughs> I understand we, uh, they wanted us outside around 7, so I think we got a few minutes to, uh, yeah. So please, uh, I know you can't ask questions to the pastor when he's, when he's over here, but uh, I think that. I understand about six years ago you stopped aquarium fishing, um, and you had fish collectors, which obviously brought some economy uh, to pull out. Uh, how did you make that transition with the people who were aquarium fishery people that that was their account, you know, that was how they made a living? So how, how did you address that? For one thing, there weren't uh, too many companies or people involved in, the, in, in this. Uh, there were, I understand there were two or three companies that were doing this. Um, but if I didn't say it enough, I want to stress the fact that research is a very important part of the justifications for things that we do. And uh, we are fortunate that we have the Palau International Coral Reef Center that actually, over the years, did most of the research that we can then, based on those research results, do policy work on or do regulation policy on it, or work with Congress to pass those legislation. And so the research actually helped us to say that this was not something that would sustain us. Um, they were able to do very good investigative work, which showed that uh, it was not done properly at the time by those people. 
and so it was easier for us to just put a stop to it um, because in the end of the, at the end of the day it's always weighing on a scale what is in the best interest of the people and what is sustainable and what is not and Marty, I tell you, I go first. Thank you so much for coming. We are working our way through some regulations uh, with West Hawaii Fishery Council and with the, the uh, Board of Land and Natural Resources. One of the uh, suggestions, and we have about 2,000 people that have been involved through the years with these uh, regulations. One of the suggestions is not to allow uh, scuba with spearfishing. I think that that might be something that Palau disallowed. I don't know that. I wondered if you did. There's been a, a quite a bit of objection to using, to not using scuba. We did that in 1994 when we uh, uh, did the, the law to ban fishing with scuba equipment. I happen to be a fisherman myself. That's why I found my wife, uh, because I... <laughs> uh, so I do know that the, the true fishermen will tell you that on certain months of the year, you can see a school of fish resting in a given area. For example, the giant parrotfish that can easily weigh between 45 to 80 pounds in sizes. They like to sleep in a big school uh, two days after the new moon. And you can count at, at the minimum 40 pieces all laying side by side with that uh, <coughs> the mucus, you know, they covered and they I think I call it the uh, snoring um, uh, protection or mechanism. You don't, you don't disturb the next uh, giant. Of, uh, but uh, big, the big schools uh, that uh, many of our people know can go up to 120, 200 schools of individual giant pirate fish. A fisherman with a scuba dive, uh, scuba dive equipment can wipe out that whole school of fish in one night. Mm. And we did feel the effect of the scuba fishing by our fishermen themselves and by the, the, super, uh, the, fish, uh, the fish market who noted that uh, the, the population of uh, this fish that used that can congregate as a school was kind of declining because when they, as I said, when they were congregating, it was a total wipeout for them, and so everybody started to notice that hey, this is a big danger to those fish that congregate or sleep in schools at night or during the day. Hence, we put a stop to it, and you can could see that the population also began to become more healthy than it was before. So I, I, I know there's a debate uh, back and forth on this, but the, the, the facts and the research and the actual fishermen can tell you that there is a destructive impact of using scuba diving as opposed to free diving. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. You keep mentioning your research, and I think that's so important. How can we access any of these research efforts online or elsewhere? Uh, the Palau International Coral Reef Center is uh, U.S. funded and Japan funded. It was called the Common Agenda Project, and Palau was uh, chosen as the site and beneficiary of this center, and it's supposed to. The information can benefit the, uh, the community, the region, and everybody. Also, the University of Guam, <clears throat> in their research efforts, have also collaborated to put out some of this research. I will tell you that one of the most uh, effective research results actually show that uh, if we open the, the whole reef 
to 365 days of fishing, seven days a week, the population of this reef, this total reef, would not sustain itself for a very long time. If only you would designate one third of this area as a, a no-take zone, then actually this one third repopulated and reju rejuvenated the two third and made it a more sustainable fishing area for, for anybody. Now this actually only reinforced what our forefathers already knew about fishing along the coastline of Palau. They always told you, don't overstress fishing on a particular area. You fish despite a good day, you move on to another area. Let that area heal itself. Let the wounded fish uh, heal themselves. Let the spawners spawn. And so you would, by the time you came back to the, to the original area, maybe six months at least or eight months has lapsed. That was the rotating way of, uh, of fishing. And actually the research uh, reinforced exactly that. You don't have to close the whole area as a no-take zone. Just make sure that one third of it is uh, no-take and that will be enough to balance the two thirds that you can fish 365 days of the year. How are you dealing with invasive species? Because that's one of the biggest problems here in the Hawaiian Islands for the last two centuries. Everything's come in here from everywhere else on the planet. How are you dealing with that? Uh, I would say invasive species is really not so much uh, an immediate challenge for us. Thank goodness we're, you know, we're far away, remote. Uh, the ships uh, don't carry as much uh, invasive species like Guam, for example, our neighbor, which have a very active commercial port. Uh, there's a lot of invasive species uh, there. Um, our immediate concern is really climate change, global warming, um, coral bleaching, um, acidation. All of these are contributing really to the, to the challenges that we are facing. And in fact, makes it even more imperative that we do a protected area network, that we take necessary steps to conserve. Because between, between man-made pollution and between overfishing and between climate change and global warming and, and all the um, um, human-induced uh, challenges, the reefs are really stressing themselves out as far as the, talking about the marine concern. So it helps when you kind of give relief to some of the, the, the natural environment uh, um, by setting uh, pieces of that aside. Um, in talking about the environmental studies and community development and everything you're pushing for, is there a way or is there a plan to incorporate the youth and give them responsibility in that for, so that it's not just this generation that's more concerned about the environmental protection and stuff, but for the youth at the head of time to give them a chance as well to be incorporated and to um, have, have, a, have a hand in it. That young man was recently in Palau and um, uh, I, I think he knows what uh, he, he's talking about. He saw it himself. But the, here's the reality in Pala. The older generations who had these best practices knowledge in their minds, they're dying out. And the middle generation really are not paying too much attention for an orderly um, transfer of those vital information. Surprisingly, it's the younger generation, young people like him, who are saying, hey, what about our future? You know, what's happening? So you have the very elderly generation and the very young generation, and those are, those are the groups that are talking about the future and the need to balance development. The rest of us, like us, are just concerned about paying the bills today and, 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 you know, and making a living. So in his question about the youth, I'm very happy that we have a 38-year-old scientist here. 
uh, who's also part of the research program in Pala. And they are actually the one who came up with the protective area network concept. They took matters into their, their own um, hands by actually working with the community and getting, asking the all the uh, knowledgeable fishermen and the all the <clears throat> members of the community that, hey, please tell us what, what is, are the best practices? What do we need to do to ensure that the environment is sustainable, that the environment is there? And then we'll lobby the national government to put those best practices into a law to become the legal framework. So when you're, when you're gone someday, and we don't know much about what you, you've taken away, at least there's a, there's a, a legal framework that uh, can continue to govern us. So it's really the young people who are, uh, I would say, have been championing for this, uh, the whole uh, concept of balancing development and making sure that the future is also there for them. I have a question in regards to how are you handling your, like you're talking about your young children and your education, bringing up that future, two primary aspects, recycling and sustainable farming or local grown, local, you know, as opposed to, which is a big thing we're trying to do here, um, local grown, but recycling on an island is quite challenging when it's, really all ends up in the same landfill anyway. Or, you know, it's just so hard to get it off the island and do anything with it. Are you uh, successful with that? Because an island is, can only support so much. One of the best legislation that I signed into law was the, our own recycling initiative. And so every can in Palau is worth five cents. Every single can, not a, not, not a way. Or, but every single bottle and every can, if you return that, you get five cents. And uh, the recycling center gets the two and a half cents, and the uh, Goro State government, which owns the dump site, gets the, two, the other two and a half cents. So it's a total of 10 cents for the tax. On that one. Um, it has helped. It has helped to also involve the children in collecting the cans and the bottles. Um, so it's a, it's a good initiative as far as recycling. Where we lack uh, help and we need to are the, uh, the tires and uh, really the outside sources who would be interested in coming and helping us to clean the islands. Uh, so we continue to work with uh, our donor partners, governments, and NGOs to see where, how we can help uh, beef up our efforts in this regard. Uh, what was the other part of your question? The local, the sustainable farming. Oh. Local grown farming. Yes, and uh, which brings us to our two other, besides tourism, we are concentrating on aquaculture and farming. Uh, we can no longer uh, continue to harvest from the wild. Uh, every tourist that come to Palau, they want to taste the mangrove crop, they want to taste the grouper, um, and the, all of that is being fished or harvested from that. So we've made a conscious uh, policy to promote aquaculture, uh, fish farming. And also on the uh, farming aspect, we are also concerned about our own food security. So we are also providing incentive programs for the farmers uh, in order to grow this industry. So it's really three things I can put up my hands and say, we're concentrating on tourism, we're con concentrating on farming, and we're concentrating on aquaculture. Because those three things go hand in hand. Uh, I have never seen a, a leader from Micronesia here in Hawaii. I've been here since 78, I'm from Samoa. But it's a pleasure and an honor to hear you speak. Uh, in Micronesia, there's a lot of people over here. And, uh, it's nice to see a leader like you come out. Uh, you know, especially this community too, because a lot of students in every school now. I know like a thousand uh, Yatis, <coughs> friends of mine, that we work together. And uh, 
it's, it's really a nice opportunity for us as a community to listen to you. Uh, it's, a, it's a real honor for me and for everybody. Uh, I am a, a scuba diver all my life here and also a uh, fisherman, but I'm a select fisherman. If I want a papillo, that's what I'd be chasing. <laughs> and when I get that papillo or one uhu, then I come home. I don't just shoot anything anywhere. So people got to be conservative in their mind, you know, don't just shoot anything, you know, that you see in the ocean. But uh, the other thing is, uh, You know, uh, we have conser conservation people coming into the island. But you know, a lot of people have no money. Sometimes there is no money at home. You gotta get out there and fish. So what I want you to know is we have to make sure that they can still fish, but conservatively. Because if, if this conservation take everything away, <clears throat> they're going to be hungry. <coughs> and uh, I can understand uh, where the conservation people are. But me as a fisherman myself, I'm very conservative. Select fishing. So that would be something, you know, uh, that could be taught. But don't take away the whole island, the, the, the whole area where people need that fish to eat. Yes, and I think that's the point uh, at the end of, uh, of the day, that's the point that needs to be made, is that there has to be a middle ground where we can all acknowledge that we cannot be too extreme on one side or, be, or, or, or another side, that there is a, a proper way, that there is a planned way, that there is a better way in which we can sustain ourselves. Because the life of the fisherman is not just for today. The life of the fisherman is 10, 15, 20 years, 30 years from now also. So this is all about you know, sustaining, and that's the key word here. And by the way, I'll just share this with you. My father, my grandfather, would always say to us that the worst invention that man made to the population of the marine fish is the ice box. <laughs> Imagine if there was no ice box. Uh, we would have select fishing uh, or balanced fishing or, but uh, yes. I'm sure everybody else here has mentioned. Um, I'm an educator and I'm very concerned about, you mentioned the, the success that you've had with your programs and the importance of aquaculture. <coughs> I'm wondering, since I don't know that much about your education system, how much of this is being incorporated into the school systems so the children can learn as they grow every year, so that this will become second hand to them, all this protection. You, you phrased up a very good uh, reason why you know, these environmental programs are picking up speed and pick up, picking up support. It's the public education, it's the public awareness part of it that is, uh, and in we in Palau actually focus on, the, on the, the, the young elementary school children and the high school because we, we know that our habits are already bad, but at least uh, when we're gone, the next generation will have the. And uh, Senator Klai is of, often very proud to talk or joke about uh, the Toro being our friend. Um, it was a public campaign. We know we love turtles, by the way, in Palau, and I think we overindulge in it. And that's really one of the, I always say that's, that's one of the good example that Hawaii has to give and show everybody that you have a very strong policy here and that your turtle population is thriving and that can only be a good thing. And I wish everybody were along the same uh, wave. Unfortunately for us in Palau, it's a little bit too heavy on the consumer side. And so we started a campaign to educate our young people that the turtle is our friend. The turtle is our friend. I can honestly say that I can no longer 
kill a turtle in our own yard because my children will not allow me to do it. He said, how could you do this to our friend? <laughs> so I find that when I want turtle soup, I have to go and look for my friends and eat somewhere else. <laughs> But uh, good odds to the young and to the next generation. Uh, something of this kind of things has to be implanted in the young people's mind. Okay. And I want to congratulate you first for uh, the graduation of your daughter, Lali, from uh, New York So we did make it all the way here. I have a couple of Palau students here to honor you. Uh, bless you. So uh, also, uh, I just realized that the uh, Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs is here, so I have to now watch my words. <laughs> uh, it's here as well. Uh, one simple uh, comment, and that's just out of respect. I'm a, and pardon my uh, emotion here. I'm a citizen of the Federal States of Micronesia. Uh, I grew up on a very small island uh, in Chuuk. And one of the, the signs as you speak about fishermen one of the major signs of how you get the most beautiful wife is if you travel far to fish, and you have traveled very far to fish, and I'm sure you will be blessed by these people here. Can I just interrupt? I had to travel far to, to fish, because I, I did catch my wife in California, of all places. <laughs> because you are, uh, in fact, the leader and the inspiration of the Micronesia Challenge. Uh, and so I just want to honor you for that, and I, I laid that on it. I know we want to get out there and get some food. The island way. Thank you. Let me just say that while he recognized my daughter, I want to share this information with you. My father is a graduate of UH Manoa. My brother uh, is also a graduate of the UH Hilo. My sister, who is now a judge, is a graduate of UH Manoa. Um, and my oldest son is a graduate of UH Hilo. And now my oldest daughter just recently graduated from UH Hilo. So again, uh, this is the island way. We support and help each other. And I am always, uh, uh, it shows that Hawaii has done a lot of good things for the islands and for the region. And in hopefully in a small way, Palau can also cooperate and collaborate with Hawaii to put out a good sustainable program for not only our reef, but our land. And I thank you and I ask for your blessings on this as we move and think about the next generations to come. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.